Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, bonjour, good morning and welcome uh, to the opening session of this year's French-Australian Forum on uh, Water and Land Management. My name is Catherine Daniel and I'm a research fellow here at the Australian National Uni University and one of the conveners of this forum. First of all, this morning, we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Before the proceedings begin, I would also like to give our sincere thanks uh, for the financial and in-kind support uh, we have received for the development of this forum, in particular from the French Embassy, uh, l'Institut Francais, RSTA, the UNESCO Chair on Water Economics and Transboundary Water Governance, the ANU College of Arts and Social Sciences, the ANU Water Initiative, the ANU Centre for European Studies and the CSIRO. I would now like to give the floor to Do uh, Dr. Eric Lithander, Pro's Vice Chancellor, International and Outreach. Well, good morning, everyone, and good morning to, uh, to ANU on this uh, uncharacteristically uh, grey and wet Canberra morning. For those of you who have travelled to be here, uh, our friends who live here will tell you that Canberra winters are usually clear and crisp and sunny. Uh, hopefully that will, uh, we'll get back to that in a few days. Uh, ambassador and distinguished guests and colleagues and friends from the Australian government, um, students and friends of ANU, welcome. Uh, delighted to welcome you to the French Australian Forum on Water and Food Security, Shaping Land Use Futures. Uh, the ANU is recognized internationally as Australia's leading university. Uh, and we have particularly long-standing record of excellence in water, uh, landscape and environmental management, international development and policy. Uh, and much of this work is carried out in collaboration with international partners, uh, many of them, of course, uh, with our, our French colleagues, many of whom are here today. We have researchers across all of our seven colleges uh, working in these areas, including large numbers in the Crawford School of Public Policy, which is the, the, the school you're in uh, at the moment, which is hosting us in this beautiful building. The location of ANU in the, in the national capital, and for those of you who have traveled here, hopefully, if the weather improves, you'll have the opportunity to, um, to see a little bit of our, of our capital. Our location in the capital en enables us also to have very strong relationships with the Australian government and the Australian Public Service and the, Dipl the Diplomatic Corps, which ensures that our researchers can, can make the best uh, use of international collaboration, uh, which, is, which is an international priority for us. This forum and the overarching French-Australian initiative on water and land management is an excellent example of how uh, significant international research programs can be driven forward in collaboration. Also, French businesses like uh, Veolia and Suez de Grimont and research organizations such as uh, IRSTIA, CIRAD, IRD, INRA, and the CNRS uh, are globally acknowledged as leaders uh, in water, environment, and agricultural management and research. So it's a natural fit for us, and we're very pleased to be working with these organizations. We very much value the opportunity that this uh, initiative provides. Uh, for us to further strengthen our relationships uh, between French and Australian researchers and to drive future research uh, between a range of partners, uh, including all the ones that are here today. I'm particularly grateful to the French Embassy uh, and to IRSTIA for uh, their sustained contribution and support for the development of this initiative and the forum. And, and it's now my great pleasure to invite His Excellency the Ambassador to address us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, I will really need a microphone today. Uh, I'm sorry, I came back from Paris just uh, some days ago with a terrible cold, and so I will try to do my best with uh, the limited voice today to, to, to say a few words uh, for the opening of this important uh, seminar. Uh, first, it's uh, always a pleasure to come here at the ANU. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Eric, for your kind words. Uh, and uh, it's especially a pleasure to come here at the Crawford School. I just mentioned to Eric that, um, when was it, probably uh, six months ago, 
there was an official opening of this uh, Crawford School with the Prime Minister, and uh, it's a pleasure to be, to be back on this wonderful premise. Uh, may I welcome also this morning uh, um, representatives from uh, various um, institutions, academic institutions, centers of research, Australian, Canberra, ANU, and also from France. And I would like also to address uh, a special welcoming to my, uh, I would say, French citizens, those who have come uh, from far, from France, Marseille, Paris, and those who have come from France, but uh, a bit closer, those coming from uh, New Caledonia. And you have mentioned, Eric, uh, the participation of key research institutions like uh, CIRAD, IRD, IRSTEA, and CNRS. And I'm very glad those representatives are here with us today. And I would, I would like also to uh, acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, representatives of uh, some French companies uh, specialized in uh, water management, uh, which are strongly present here in Australia, especially uh, uh, Veolia, uh, Suez Environnement, and the Grimo. Of course, today <coughs> I will absolutely not make any uh, comments on uh, scientific uh, angle. I would be completely unable of that. My only, I would say, comments today would be uh, comments uh, as, a, as a diplomat. Uh, I'm just a generalist with very, I would say, uh, general average knowledge of this very important issue, which is the one of, about food and water security. I just want to make uh, you know, a few remarks on how we see uh, those issues of food safety and um, water security. I think if you see the um, challenges we have to face, the range of challenges our governments have to face, certainly the issues of food safety, water security, are ranging, I would say, at the top of those challenges, I would say, on an emergency basis, but also on a long-term perspective. Just a few, uh, I would say, figures, or uh, not figures, but uh, thoughts about those challenges we have to face uh, altogether. In terms of uh, water security, I'm sure you are all very familiar with all these uh, figures. I took them from uh, international reports uh, from the United Nations, and I'm sure that I will not, uh, um, it will not uh, be new for you, but I think these figures are very key to better comprehend the challenges of uh, water security and food safety. In terms of water security, today we still, still have 900 million people uh, who still do not have access to drinkable water. So this represents something like, I don't know, probably 35% of the, um, not 35%, but uh, uh, one-tenth or one, yes, one-tenth of the world population. And those people are mainly located in Africa and in Asia. Worst, if you look at the number of people in terms of access to uh, sanitation, you have today 2.6 billion people, which represent about one third of the world population, which, who do, sorry, do not have access to basic water sanitation. And of course, this has a tremendous impact, especially on health. And uh, the figures in terms of uh, children affected by uh, uh, the lack of access to uh, children's sanitation are absolutely incredible. Uh, the la latest figures show that you have 1.5 million children uh, who die every year because of infections, diarrhea, uh, disease uh, due to uh, insane water. So this is an issue in terms of access, but also this is an issue in terms of uh, uh, world health, especially children health. In terms of uh, food security, I would say the uh, figures and the records are not really bright. You have still today 800 million people which, uh, who are considered as being chronically underfed. And if you see the evolution of this population, the number of people still uh, underfed is not decreasing. 
Once again, in terms of food security, the children are paying the highest price. I think this is uh, assessed that about 200 million children are affected uh, or face stunted growth, once again, mainly in Africa and in Asia. Of course, we uh, decided, the international community, to try to cope with this issue of uh, food safety and uh, um, water security. You are probably aware that uh, two of the Millennium Development Goals are focused on those two issues, but uh, the results are quite uh, disappointing. And today, the two Millennium uh, Development Goals, which were you know, fixed for uh, access to water and access to food, will not be met uh, by 2015. As you know, in the, in, the, in the field of food, it was decided that by 2015, uh, under, um, oh, what can I say, uh, chronic uh, sous alimentation, how do you say that, that in English? Uh, uh, Underalimented would be reduced by half, uh, but it will not be met by 2015. And also in uh, water security, reducing by half by 2015 the uh, non-access to drinkable sources will not be met. Will not be met. So this is the sign that uh, the international commitment to try to cope with these two challenges: water security and food security, are still ahead of us. Um, those challenges, those challenges. Sorry, when you look at the situation, the, the uh, situation is probably going to get worse and worse and worse in the time ahead of us. Uh, we can say today that uh, these challenges are going to be aggravated in the coming years. First, due, due to the demographic and urban pressure. Just one figure, which is absolutely uh, striking, in 30 years' time, the catchments of water have been multiplied by three, by a factor of three. And if you look at the evolution for the coming year, they are, there is a figure which, will, which shows that water catchment of drinkable catchment will be, will be multiplied by another factor of three, not in 30 years, but in 15 years, which is the sign that tensions on re water resources and tensions on access to drinkable water will rise in dramatic proportions. And in the food sector too, you know, the pressure of demography and urban, uh, uh, urban pressure will also increase. By 2050, there is a figure which I found in the United Nations report, which so shows that the demand for food product will increase by 60% in the forthcoming decades. So more pressure due to uh, uh, this uh, need in terms of water and this in, in terms of food, more tensions, more pressure in terms on, sorry, on land resources. So I think that the topic of your seminar today is very important. How can we cope with these tensions on water and, uh, and, and, uh, and food uh, in terms of management of land resources? But not only we have to face demographic and uh, urban pressure, we have also to face uh, the impact of climate change on water cycle and on food cycle. Uh, these uh, th phenomena are, of course, very well known to you, so I will not bring anything new to your debate. But we have to take into consideration that our countries uh, in the developed world, but also in the underdeveloped world, will face extreme climate phenomena more droughts, probably in Australia too, uh, more floods, probably in Europe. And you know that today in Europe we are facing huge uh, floods, especially in Central Europe. And these are extreme uh, climate events which will occur more and more regularly. And we have you know, to face the consequence of such extreme weather uh, phenomena. <laughs> The second impact of climate change, which I think will be very important for all our societies, 
will have to face more what we call in the uh, in your language in your research programs more idric stress in the context of uh, uh, resources getting uh, more and more scarce just one figure uh, which i think is very uh, very um, topical in 2030 uh, almost half of the world population, 47%, due to a recent report of the United Nations, will live in areas which are which will be um, attached or um, which will be affected by uh, hydric stress. Half of the population of the world will live in areas affected by uh, hydric stress. This is, of course, a figure which is absolutely outstanding. So what are the answers, and what can we do to, to try to, to cope with this phenomenon? The first response is, of course, we'll have to go through more international cooperation. It's very important that a seminar like the, uh, the one you will have for those two days take place in a year, uh, I think in the year 2013, has been declared by the United Nations as the year of water cooperation. This will require more mobilization, more international cooperation. We'll have also to be very clear, and uh, we'll have to, to, to spend more money, more resources, more aid program on water uh, security and on food safety. It will be a key priority for our aid agencies. And today, we are working closer uh, between the French uh, uh, aid agency, Agence Française de Développement, and the Austrian one, OSAID. We consider, and I've seen this figure in, uh, in reports of development agencies, that 25% um, of the cost of adaptation to climate change in the coming years will have to be spent, will have to be spent in the field of you know, water systems, uh, securing uh, more uh, um, secure networks, water, water networks, and also digging more wells. So I think in the coming years, we'll have to, decade, to dedicate more and more resources uh, in terms of water security. So more international co cooperation is certainly a key in terms of addressing those challenges. And I would say also more and more bilateral exchanges. I just mentioned what we, are going, what we do together uh, between France and Australia, uh, between our two aid agencies. But I think that such a seminar, putting in common uh, scientists, experts, uh, is very important to better comprehend the phenomenons we'll have to face and also to define what kind of uh, scientific programs we can define together. Our two countries have many things in common, in fact, in terms of uh, uh, food and water security and the impact of uh, those challenges on the land management. I think our two countries have very strong public policies in that uh, regard, strong public institutions. In France, we have, uh, of course, uh, what we call the uh, Agence de Bassin. I don't know how we, we can translate it in, in, in English, but, uh, you know, um, water basin, basins uh, uh, regulatory agencies. You have such agencies also here in, in Australia. And I think, you know, comparing our models uh, comparing the way of uh, those public agencies work, I think is an issue of importance between our two countries. Our two countries also have very strong research capacities in the field of uh, uh, water, uh, um, uh, agriculture, and uh, land management. And I think putting together, pooling our research capacities uh, is something very, very important. And I understand also that in Australia, there is a, a rise in the public awareness on these issues of food security and, uh, food sa and water safety. I think in France, this is already the case. But I think this issue of uh, outreach and uh, trying to, to uh, better share with our public opinions the outcome, the challenges in the field of uh, um, food and water security is something we have the responsibility to, to do all together. We still have some um, efforts to, to, to do. I've uh, seen a statistic which is uh, uh, quite uh, striking. In France, the um, water consumption for each per capita represents something like 530 
square, uh, sorry, cubic meter a year. In Australia, this is double. The latest figures show that per capita water consumption in Australia is 900 cubic meter. We have reduced in France uh, such uh, water consumption. In Australia, I think more uh, efforts have to be made uh, to, to be made also to reduce such a pressure on the water resources. And probably such a seminar could be a good occasion to see what kind of concrete means can be uh, proposed to our authorities to reduce water consumptions in our two countries. So uh, I think it's a good opportunity you know, to have such a seminar to discuss those uh, very uh, strategic <coughs> central issues. I understand this is uh, the second time such a seminar is organized. We had a first edition, when was it? Last year in France, two years ago in France. And uh, I hope uh, this forum would be an occasion of uh, exchange of practicing, of practices, sorry, exchange of data, exchange of policies, and also exchange of uh, research programs. Uh, as far as the French Embassy here is concerned, we are absolutely convinced that uh, such a seminar is a key in terms of scientific cooperation between France and Australia. We are very happy to have contributed to the financing and to the organization of such a seminar, and you can count on us to continue ahead with you and to continue supporting such initiatives. Sorry once again for my uh, uh, poor voice. Um, I suggest the next seminar uh, can have uh, a theme concentrated on uh, winter in Canberra and pharmace pharmaceutical cooperation between <laughs> France and Australia. I wish you the best. I would be very happy to welcome you tomorrow at the French uh, residence to continue and to, to close our, sem our seminar with uh, a small reception at the French Embassy. And uh, uh, for these two days, enjoy your, uh, your seminar. And I wish you the best for this forum. Thank you very much. Well, Your Excellency, on behalf of ANU, but also of everyone uh, here today, thank you very much uh, for your time today and for your support and the Embassy's support uh, in, uh, with this forum. We genuinely appreciate it. Um, I, I agree entirely, and I think all of, all of us agree with you that international cooperation will be uh, the key to addressing many of these issues. Uh, at ANU, we have a range of institutes and centers and initiatives focused on this area, such as, uh, of course, our various research schools, but also the ANU Water Initiative, uh, the Food Policy Institute, which was only launched uh, last week, uh, the ANU Center for European Studies, uh, the Development Policy Institute and our UNESCO Chair on Water Economics and Transboundary Water Governance, all of which are playing an important role and will continue to play an important role in, in uh, contributing to this, um, to this work. Um, we're, of course, very keen to, con to strengthen our relationships uh, with France and with all the institutions here today. So I thank you again for coming. Uh, I wish you a very productive couple of days. Uh, and I very much look forward to hearing uh, the outcomes and to... Uh, in this activity going forward. Thank you very much. Better? Okay, so this morning the idea is to have a little bit more of a discussion around some of those major challenges that the, um, that the ambassador has set forward for us. Um, we're very lucky to have a, a very interesting uh, collection of panellists here today. And what we were planning to do this morning is just to ask each of our panellists uh, to give us a few introductory remarks on some of the work that they are doing or their institution is doing uh, in food and water security and how that's shaping land use futures. So we'll give each of our panellists about five minutes of introductory remarks and then we'll move the discussion on to look at some of those uh, examples of collaboration, how we may collaborate uh, more effectively in the future. Um, so our first panellist is um, Professor Quentin Grafton. <laughs> Uh, one of my fellow co-conveners uh, of this forum. Uh, Quentin is a professor of economics here at the Crawford School of Public Policy. He is also the chairholder of the UNESCO Chair uh, in Water Economics and Transboundary Water Governance and director of the ANU Centre for Water Economics, Environment and Policy. So Quentin, would you like to 
Thanks very much, Catherine, and thanks for everyone for coming, and, and special uh, welcome to, to our French friends who've traveled a great distance. I know someone's come from New Caledonia, <laughs> which is still a considerable distance, nevertheless, uh, certainly compared to my, my travels. So five minutes. Uh, uh, so I have five points, which I, I think follow on from the ambassador's comments, and I'll try and weave it into a story about what we're doing in the, uh, the UNESCO chair here at the, at the a ANU. So the, the five points, first one is uh, food and water security doesn't just happen. It'd be nice if it did. It just you know, fell off a tree or something like that and, uh, and landed in our laps and we didn't have to worry about it. But it doesn't just happen. Uh, it's, it's a function of you know, trade policy, what we do in terms of food exports. It's a function in terms of what we do in terms of our investments in basic research. It's a function of what we do in terms of water management. So it, it has all those dimensions that require you know, public intervention in various uh, shapes and forms. The second point is the deja vu, uh, in the sense that uh, I raised this last week at the Food Policy Institute. Uh, back in 1973, we had a world food crisis. There are a variety of reasons for that, um, but we dealt with it. Uh, we had a huge increase in grain production over the last uh, 40 years, and we've had calorie per capita per capita calorie intake increase about 15%, 40% um, plus in the East Asia and uh, about 5% or so in, in Africa. Regardless, it was across the board increases over the last 40 years. So we met that challenge and we did it in a variety of different ways. Um, we'll have to do it in different ways uh, as we go for the next 40 years. So the third, third, third issue is the food gap. And the ambassador did mention this out to 2050 and there's various numbers out there and uh, that's part of I think the issue that we want to talk through in the next couple of days. What is the, the demand gap? So we look at the minimum it's 30% increase in food production required to 2050. Could be upwards of 70% and if you want to take a number in between it's 50%. Uh, but regardless it's a major challenge to meet that food gap. We've got an increased population, we're going to have an increase in incomes uh, and we're also going to have uh, no doubt a change in diets which will have implications in terms of the requirements for food, in fact, increasing the requirements for food. The fourth issue is the yield gap. So the food gap is the, the challenge from the demand. The yield gap is actually how do we deliver it. Uh, we really don't have extensive pieces of land that are available to us to utilize. Most of that land has already been utilized. And if we were to access a land that's not currently in production in terms of agriculture, then that will uh, generate a whole range of uh, external costs for us. Climate change is one of them, but that goes well beyond that. So it has to be about sustainable intensification. Uh, yields of growth is in fact decreased, okay? Yield growth has, is still positive, but it has in fact decreased. Uh, so that's, uh, that's certainly a challenge uh, to, to increase the uh, yield, uh, yield growth over the coming decades. And then the fifth point is the water gap. Um, it's no surprise to anyone here, of course, crops need water, and they need water in terms of rain-fed uh, crops, but also in terms of ir irrigation. So that's going to be a major challenge. Again, the ambassador pointed out that to us. We've got to face that challenge uh, globally, and we have to face that challenge here in Australia. So those are the five key points. Where does the UNESCO chair lead into this? The UNESCO chair here is based at the ANU. It's been, been running for a little over three years now. It's got another year to go and has the potential of being renewed. We've been focusing our work in Africa. We've been working with various uh, individuals and various organizations in Southern Africa. So we've been looking at uh, taking the, the learnings we have here and what the learnings are in Africa in terms of water economics. Water economics is my particular area of expertise, but we have for Kath, uh, Daniel Connell is here. Uh, Jamie Pettick is in fact, it was also associated with the UNESCO chair, is in fact in Africa right now, working on agricultural and water issues in Mozambique. Um, we're looking at connecting the water the food and the economic issues uh, and the governance issues uh, collectively. We've done a number of activities in, in, in Southern Africa in terms of uh, teaching activities, mentoring activities. We've done a number of activities which have been funded by ACI, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, working on the issues of uh, green and blue water and sustainable use of water and the use of uh, taking into account the issues of uh, uh, the, the costs associated with the agricultural development and taking those into account in terms of the environment. So uh, that's my five minutes, so thank you. So thank you very much, Quentin. I think there's a nice, a nice uh, number of things that we can already see that Australia... Your centre is doing. Um, I'd now like to invite my next uh, fellow co-convener of this forum, uh, Olivier Barato. Uh, Olivier 
uh, is the uh, director of to be director of the UMR Geo, uh, which is the French uh, joint research group on water management and stakeholders. Uh, he comes from uh, Erstia in France. And has uh, many, many years of experience looking uh, at all sorts of different uh, parts of hydrology and modelling uh, up in Africa and other places. So, Olivier. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so yeah, I'm coming from Insta and I'm very glad to be here with my French colleagues uh, since uh, it comes after the uh, uh, initial workshop two years ago in France, in Montpellier. And so I'm glad to see that the dynamics go on. And so I will, um, in our first forum, we shared experience between research in Australia on land and water issues and, and research in France on land and water issues. And this first forum was based a lot from contribution of a French research program on land and water, uh, funded by the French Ministry of Environment, uh, IRSTEA and CNRS. Um, so now I'm, I'm also taking the hat of um, um, manager of this program. Um, and so I will give you some uh, update on, on the research within this program. So for those who were not in Montpellier two years ago, um, this program uh, started in 2006 or 2007, and it, it aims at understanding the, the dynamics of uh, these complex systems which associate land and water, and how land part and water part uh, co-evolve. Co it also aims at um, providing support to public policies, so it's really embedded in public policies. And uh, each project funded under this program um, has its own partnership with local um, public policy stakeholders. It actually, it funding, it's funding 19 projects for uh, about 6 million euros, and uh, with uh, yearly workshops of, of exchanges between um, all the research projects. And this year, the next workshop will be in October, and also um, aiming at tackling the issue of agriculture uh, in the land and water issues. Um, among the, I won't get into the details of the, all the projects, but um, among them, uh, we are mainly focusing on French issues, so it's really a French program. Uh, but also, there has been two projects, and Jean was part of them, um, in Kenya. And um, and the topics go from uh, wetland governance to domestic water uh, conservation um, in relation with agriculture, and also on long-range evolution of uh, river basins with an uh, interface between water and society, and also um, specific issues on the place of scientists and expertise in, um, in uh, putting up the development of, of, a land, of, of land development. Initial lessons of these projects are that um, the connection between land and water is really place-based uh, and contingent to uh, the relations uh, which have been built in the past between a society and its environment. And so that means that um, if you want to, to, to understand how um, you may use water in one place, in, uh, in order to ensure water security or use water for food security, you have to understand this, this relation. Um, and so that means we need to, to understand the sense of place and probably we, we have to learn some uh, of what you've done here with work and I think Anne maybe will tell about her experience on that taking, taking the, the sense of place and the identity of, of, a, of a land. Uh, that's, uh, that's the issue of, of uh, land control, which is behind, of obviously. Um, in this project, the, the food and the farming uh, is actually quite uh, uh, not that much present, um, or only as a sectoral issue. And I think that's the main uh, one of the main um, uh, challenge for our uh, seminar uh, these two days is to reintegrate uh, the f f food production and, f and agriculture within uh, this uh, systemic view of land and water. Um, and the reason for that is that um, farming is considered like uh, a specific industry. It's, it's either considered as a specific industry with a worldwide view, so how um, we can do business uh, and, and sell our crops 
all, all, all over the world, so it's not anymore uh, place-based. Uh, how we can um, collectively um, act to feed the whole population, as you mentioned, as the, and as the ambassador mentioned um, prior um, to our um, panel. And see, again, it's not place-based, it's just we have a common, the global responsibility of feeding the world. Um, but also, we, there is another trend which is uh, uh, fast emerging in France, but I think also in Australia, and in many in many parts of the developed world. This is of a um, trend of local food production, what in French we name uh, circuit court, uh, where the, the aim is to produce locally, to eat locally. But and each um, um, food crisis uh, we have, uh, last, the last one we had in Europe with um, with meat, uh, it uh, increased the the, the the demand for locally produced uh, food. Um, so we, there is these two trends um, which um, need to take uh, their place in this um, land and water uh, complex systems. Um, so I think that's m my main points for, for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. And I, I hope that some of those uh, comments will probably be taken up um, we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Anne Polina here uh, from all the way from the Kimberley region this morning. Um, she's the Managing Director of Medulla <laughs> Incorporated who, and she's also a Fellow of the Peter Cullen uh, Water and Environment Trust uh, and of course a Nikita, um, Nikina traditional owner of the Lower Madurwara in the Fitzroy River in the West Kimberley uh, in Western Australia. Uh, Anne is a well-known defender of uh, Aboriginal rights in Australia uh, and was a signatory of the Redstone Statement in 2010. Um, last year she was invited to talk at the uh, Human Rights Commission in UNESCO in Paris and has presented at various conferences uh, in Paris and often she uses Spiel, uh, for some of her work. So we're looking very forward to hearing um, some remarks. Hello. Ngajinu Nila Wala and Polina Ngai Imaro Roman and Ngai Mandajara Nyigin and Ngai Nyigin and Nganga Ngai Good morning, my name is Anne Polina. I'm a traditional owner from the Kimberley. Um, uh, Imadawara means people who belong to the lower Fitzroy River. Um, I th would like to thank Catherine for this opportunity to come to Canberra. Um, I'm out there, um, I fund a not-for-profit organisation and I think what I'm appreciating is an opportunity not just to have dialogue, but to grow this into dialogic <coughs> action. So yes, last year I did go to, to uh, France and uh, traveled and presented at UNESCO and went to Montpellier and traveled right throughout the <coughs> east of France. And I think one of the things that many of the French people were quite surprised about was to some extent how Australia, in some instances of land and water management, is ignoring international evidence, ignoring in better practice when it comes to working with uh, Australians. So what I want to put on the table is that if we are to go forward in a spirit of cooperation, it must be based on mutual trust and respect, and we must be honest about how we enter the dialogue if we are to create this transformational change. So in terms of a sense of place, um, people would say, you know, Indigenous Australians. I think people, when I travelled the world, people are quite surprised that there is this concept of Indigenous people in Australia. What does that mean? It means that we are the first people in this country. We are the first people, the Indigenous people, who have lived here for thousands and thousands of years. My people who are the water people, we know all of these things. You know, we know that our coexistence is heavily reliant on the balance between social, cultural, human and environmental capital we coexist with the birds, with the animals, with the snakes, with all of those things. So for us, our well-being is not just about the individual, it is about a holism and a collectivism. And what I say for Indigenous people is that our knowledge is grounded in lived experience over millennia. And there is much that we can share and teach, not only Australians, but the world. When we look at the Indigenous people around the world, we occupy 24% of the land mass but within that landmass, there's 84% of biodiversity. And that is not a coincidence. We are there because we are custodians of these, the, these creatures that I talk about. And it is about balance and it is about living in harmony. So in regards to France, France is about 
over 500,000 square kilometres. The Kimberley is over 400,000 square kilometres. To travel to the nearest town south is six hours in a car. To travel to the, near, the closest one to the north is two hours. So I just want to give you a bit of appreciation in regards to the location and the remoteness of the context in which I live and which I operate. Um, last year, uh, the Kimberley, in, sorry, in 2011, the Kimberley was registered on the National Heritage Trust and it was registered because of the coexistence of all sorts of people that have come to the Kimberley to call the Kimberley their home. With the Kimberley, within the Kimberley there are geographical regions, the hill country which is made of mountains, the river country, the coast, the desert. So there are Aboriginal people from great diversity who have got so much to share. And I guess one of the messages from the old people is no river, no people. And it is so important that we as Indigenous people, not only here in Australia but around the world, we still have a role to play. And we're saying that we're coming with our open hand and our open heart. And we in Australia, just in terms of international visitors, you may not be aware, but Indigenous people in remote areas live in fourth world conditions. Our life expectancy is 20 to 30 years less than uh, most Australians. Most people in my family have died by the time they are 50. And this is just to give you some context in terms of what we're saying is that we are out there, we are a people who can bring much to this, to this uh, dialogue. And as I said, it can't just be about dialogue, it must be about action. So, the, you know, as I said, the Kimberley is an amazing place. Um, <clears throat> it's very interesting. We have had French filmmakers coming to the Kimberley because many of you may not have, be aware or you may have heard James Price Point. It was going to be the biggest industrial gas precinct in the world, bigger than Qatar. But because people have mobilised, because people have come from all over the world to support us, you know, one of the big things that people said is that it wasn't the people, it was the economic international climate that turned it around. But, you know, we are standing not as protesters, but as protectors of the wilderness that we love. So it is very, very important. In regards to indigenous people across northern Australia, we are talking about a savannah system that goes from Broome to Cairns. We are talking about a savannah system that we are looking very hungrily to the south for how can we learn from what has been happening with the Murray-Darling Basin. You know, um, we had the Northern Development Task Force a couple of years ago that came up and said, do not look at the Kimberleys and the Northern Territory as the next food bowl. It is a finger bowl. Okay, so we need to learn from the science. We need to learn by a collaboration with different parties. In regards to Northern Australia, there's an organisation called the Northern Australian Indigenous Land and Sea Management Alliance. It is including Indigenous people from right across the North, we have developed indigenous policies around water. We are passionate about trying to secure water rights in this country around strategic indigenous reserves, all of those things, cultural values. You know, we are struggling with environmental flows in this country and can you imagine how difficult it is to get the, on the agenda cultural values. So these are the things that are out there. So, you know, my lived experience, you know, people say, what, do you, what are you? <laughs> and I do not say I'm an ac activist, I say I'm an actionist. I do not want just activism, I want action. So that is how I describe myself. So in regards to Western Australia, my, the biggest state in this country, what ha have I witnessed? What I've witnessed now is that, you know, when the Labor government was in some years ago, they developed world's best practice with the sustainability development framework. Since the Liberal government have come in, there has been no investment in that area. What I have seen in WA is that the West Australian government is now becoming a proponent for mining. They are changing and putting in through acts of parliament bills that enshrine the rights of the corporation over ordinary people. So these are the th sorts of things that we're working with. So we were working, you know, in terms of cross exchange of information, but the reality is we are being driven not by evidence for best practice, but by a political paradigm that is in charge, not just of indigenous people, but we are losing our land and water sovereignty in this country to the corporations. And I think what we need to look at is the international context of globalization and the way that, you know, the corporations are now colonizing ordinary Australians, colonizing the land, colonizing the water. So we need to look at this. And I guess one of the things I'm saying is that Western Australia is introducing what they're calling planning reform. So what that means is that 
with the state government. They introduced new planning regimes that now override local government. So there are things being introduced called the Development Assessment Panel. Anything over $3 million no longer goes through the local government. It goes to the state to make decisions. Any industrialisation, any development, all of that. So we are seeing those sorts of things. We are seeing planning laws called improvement plans, improvement schemes, where the state government comes up into the local government area and excises out the land that they want for development. So we have to be realistic, we have to be truthful, and we have to say that we are working with a political, within a political context that needs to be grounded in good science, that needs to be fully there, extending their hand to Indigenous people in a true partnership for how we move forward. There is no, pre, no free, prior and informed consent decision making when we do this because why Indigenous people are being used as part of the process to oppress other Australians, as part of the process to get agreements up through mining and those sorts of things. So it's very, very important that we look at what are the alternatives. After 30 or 50 years of mining and resource extraction, what happens then when the land, when the water and all of that is destroyed, when the food is destroyed? So what I want to put on the table is that we are working in a conflict paradigm and I think it's time that we are here and we see the Kimberley as world assets, that we sit around the table as world citizens in a context of how do we start to do business differently. And my plea is how do we move from a conflict paradigm to a cooperative paradigm? And what I'm saying is that Indigenous people are there, we are doing very good work in Australia and there needs to be recognition that we still have a role to play. And so we extend this arm and this hand and this in friendship and we open our heart and say that there's so much that we can tell you. You know, in regards to water connectivity, we can be way into the desert and my old people will sing the song and they will tell you how that water travels underground. They will tell you about the connectivity. They will tell you that when we talk about aquifers and ancient waters, we talk about old water. So we are wise people and we want to be able to extend in friendship this opportunity to collaborate. The Kimberley is an amazing area and it is there and it is a blank canvas. If it is a greenfield area to the mining development, it is a greenfield area for all scientists. So thank you for this opportunity and I hope that we can move forward in a spirit of cooperation and look at how do we do business differently in the north and how can we learn and, and share what we have as human beings in creating a greater humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, for all of your words. And I hope that we will be able to move from conflict to cooperation and actually get to the action. Dr. John Albergel, uh, who is a senior scientist in hydrology at IRD. And over the past decade, he has held a number of other positions in the Institute as Deputy Director of the Water and Soils Program and the IRD representative for East Africa on the International Council of Europe in Kenya. Um, since 2006, he has been the coordinator of European Affairs at IRD and he's stationed in Marseille. So we're very happy Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And it's my great pleasure to be here to tell you some words about my institution, IRD. And I want to thank you, Catherine, and thank Olivier for the invitation. Uh, IRD, the French Institute of Research for Development, is a French governmental research organization under the joint authority of two ministries, the Ministry of Higher Education and Research and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It develops research and training programs in partnership with developing countries to address international development issues in respect with uh, the Millennium um, Development Goals, the MDG. Emphasizing interdisciplinarity, IRD has focused its research for over 65 years on relationship between man and its environment. And perhaps we are discovering a little bit later what the people from Kimberley know from so long. Um, we are in Africa, in Mediterranean, in Latin America, Southeast Asia, Pacific and Surrey countries, and the French tropical overseas territories. 
IRD is hosting uh, three scientific departments and one agency for funding issues. The three uh, departments are the first one on uh, environment and natural resources, the second on health, and the third on so social sciences and humanities. These three departments and uh, the agency uh, combine their efforts to uh, to promote consortia and platform on research for food and water security, and also on uh, nutritional aspects as a complement uh, very important to, to food and water security, and this in a context of climate change. We have developed a partnership uh, platform for, uh, called SREC for Rural Societies, Environment and Climate Change in uh, West Africa. In uh, East Africa, we have a research platform in partnership with, uh, th with these uh, countries called Erego for heritage, resource, and governance. And uh, we try uh, to uh, to study and to promote traditional knowledge on water and food security. And in East Africa, in East Asia, we have also a platform. This, uh, this one uh, supported by uh, the AU, by an AU funding called uh, Smiling and working on uh, nutritional uh, security and on biosafety and almost also on uh, biosafety on water, uh, problem of uh, pesticide in uh, the water. Uh, on the innovation side, we can uh, quote uh, several results. Uh, for water uh, security, for example, we promote uh, in uh, West Africa and East Africa uh, the, um, the concept of uh, artificial flooding to, um, to secure the um, ecosystem services of uh, flooded uh, uh, areas, and I will, I will speak about that uh, tomorrow. Uh, we, we have also uh, some, um, partnership, uh, so, some partnership in uh, entrepreneurial, um, uh, what do you call this? To uh, to have to uh, some incubators of entreprise, and uh, one incubator in Senegal, in Odev, is an initiative between uh, the University Sheikh Anta Diop of Dakar and IRD, and uh, we had uh, some uh, results, and we have some uh, enterprise uh, in um, f fish farming, for example. Um, who it's a link between food and water security in Africa. And uh, also IRD worked a lot on uh, biotechnology, on uh, food uh, biotechnology, plant biotechnology, uh, to uh, improve uh, the gen banks of uh, African varieties, and uh, also uh, for uh, safety and uh, for uh, nutrition, we had the famous uh, plum peanut who saved uh, so many children uh, during the last uh, famine in uh, the Horn of Africa. Uh, perhaps uh, before some, uh, some figures, uh, in uh, 2012, uh, IRD was a budget of uh, 200 uh, 27 million of euro, including, including 26.2 million revenue from external contracts and approved products, and the main part uh, directly from grants uh, from the French government. We are 2,346 uh, staff, including 842 PhD scientists. 43% of the staff is post abroad and depend of uh, 32 permanent representation all over the world. And I was this uh, representative for East Africa during uh, six years. Since uh, the 19, IRD is also collaborating with the other scientific advanced nation to develop trilateral scientific cooperation with developing and emerging countries. And it is in this framework 
that uh, Australian National University and IRD are partners in the PassNet project. Uh, Catherine uh, know, know it very well, which uh, is an internet uh, coordination action supported by the European Commission. Its main goal is to strengthen bi-regional sustainable dialogue on science and technology between Europe and uh, the Pacific. This project is ending uh, next September. But a new project uh, is coming, always uh, under the seventh framework program, and will begin uh, next October for eight years, uh, for three years, excuse me. And it's called PassNet Plus. And why Plus? Because it will focus on these three major societal challenges for Pacific region. The first uh, societal challenge is health, demographic change, and well-being. The second, food security, sustainable agriculture, and uh, bioeconomy. And the third one, climate action, resource efficiency, and raw material. That is our cooperation in the region, but perhaps we can do more and we can have uh, through this kind of, uh, of seminar and through the French embassies uh, to, to look how we can develop our partnership uh, in the other uh, developing country and almost in Africa where the climate are similar uh, in uh, Africa and in um, Australia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean. It's nice to also hear uh, of, of the Pacific. We've heard a lot about Africa, but it's nice to have the Pacific present here as well uh, today. Um, we're now going to move on, uh, stay with the development sector, and we're lucky to have uh, Marcus Howard here from uh, AusAid, the Australian Agency for International Development. Uh, he's the Senior Sectorial Specialist for Water and has worked in a diverse range roles uh, on aid programs in Asia, Pacific, Africa, uh, and the Middle East, uh, including in post-conflict Thanks, thanks, Catherine, and um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is just touching on themes of Australia and France as donors working towards global poverty reduction goals. And mirroring, mirroring what the ambassador said before, the Guardian newspaper recently reported that the majority of 9 billion people on Earth will live with severe pressure on fresh water within the space of two generations as climate change, pollution and overuse of resources take their toll. And of course, most of this impact will fall on, on the poor uh, and particularly in uh, fragile states. Um, so there's a need for Austra donors like Australia and France to work to support management issues in low, in fragile states, low and middle income countries. Also not forgetting, while well, middle income countries like Vietnam and, and uh, Indonesia and others have certainly got resources, there's um, have certainly a lot of issues including resource management where uh, countries like Australia and France can make a contribution to managing the food, energy, water nexus. And as an example of that, I'd like to get, talk about some of the Australian-supported programs of research in, in the Pacific, South Asia, in the Mekong and Southern Africa, which can contribute to the development and economic growth of over a billion people. Um, many, many of these places look to the Australian experience in water resource management, which, as Anne points out, is not perfect, and I think we have to acknowledge that um, sometimes what we do is not what we say, and also we, we also had to learn by doing. Um, in the Mekong, our programs are contributing to the political and economic decision making in the region, which is home to about 260 million people, and their water resources and land use are core to development and will impact on the future livelihoods and quality. Um, and that future livelihood is directly linked to choices which the current people are currently having to make, governments are having to make them, um, and the people are having to make them around economic de development and the choices around management of water <coughs> resources or land for food production, energy, and the management of ecosystems. <coughs> in 
South Asia, uh, Australia is contributing to what's known as the South Asia Water Initiative. And that's a partnership with the UK, Australia and the World Bank, which is looking at water sharing in the international waterways of Ganga, Indus and Brahmaputra, which are fed by the Himalayas. So planning decisions there can impact on the lives of over 700 million people, probably 1.5 billion people if you want to look at the wider, the wider area. And their economic development and food security requires integrated planning around the issues of food, energy, land and water access. In the Southern African Development Cooperation, uh, there's an overlap here with the work of uh, France through IRD, where we're working with Germany and the UK in the, in the transboundary program, which covers some 15 major transboundary river basins in the area. This is home to over 280 million people. And as indicated, it's the area where climate change impacts are going to be as severe as they are in Australia. <coughs> and, but it has poor resilience. So better river basin and land management policy will improve the potential for growth and food security in those areas. A recent development uh, in last week has been the issue of a high-level panel report on the post-2015 development goals, and I'm sure a lot of you may have seen it, you may not have had a, had a chance to read it yet, <coughs> but it's really uh, important to look at some of the goals and how, how, how they impact on, on this topic that we're talking about today. Uh, and just as a couple of examples, goal five, which is to ensure food security and good nutrition, which is about agricultural productivity and, and uh, fisheries. Goal six, universal access to water and sanitation, which is about the sustainable use of water as a resource. Uh, and it's, it's also interesting to note that um, there's actually a link now between poor sanitation and food security through undernutrition, looking at the impacts that poor sanitation actually has on the ability, on the ability of people in a, number of, in a number of countries to actually ingest and, and keep the food that, that they have. And then goal nine, manage natural resources sustainably, which is about safeguarding ecosystems and improving soil quality. And it's interesting because in one way or another, water and land impact across all those goals. The Asian Development Bank has identified gaps in information which are necessary for setting national targets for water use. And one of the themes of the new uh, goals is it's called universal goals to end poverty end, end poverty by 2030 but setting of national targets and the setting of national targets and particularly in areas where we're, we're talking about it, around land and water needs specific information information on, on water use information on, on possible water <coughs> supplies so there's a lot of work to be done by donors and scientific communities to support this post-2015 process, uh, and particularly in providing an evidence base for target setting around those food and water-related uh, water goals. So um, I think that, that's enough, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus, and thank you very much to all of our, our panellists. I think we can already see that there are some key things coming out here. Um, we've obviously got the, the series Global Challenges and Sustainable Development that are, that are at the forefront and a real need to improve and integrate and holistic management uh, of, of places uh, with the people that are there. Um, so the next part of our, our discussion is to try to think about what, is, what are some of the, the specific topics, the specific questions, the specific places where French and Australian cooperation uh, can be uh, of great value. And so we'd just like to hear just a few comments on that, and I think we might also open it up to the floor for some of the, the other perspectives on uh, on how we may be able to cooperate more effectively in the future that we can actually lay down that chain plan. So I don't know who would like to start with some of the work that has already been going on in uh, French and Australian cooperation and, ha and some of the key research questions you think we really need to treat in that way.
I'd like to get the audience involved, but just, just to recap uh, for some of the, I know a number of people weren't uh, at the Montpellier workshop. I want to give special thanks to Olivier and, uh, and the team uh, welcoming us there a couple of years ago. Uh, we had the, um, I think the people from France have the short end of the stick, as we say in English, because uh, you're coming to Canberra in wintertime and we went to Montpellier in, in summertime. But, uh, but just, to, just to recap, we, we had, a, I, I think, a, an, an interesting set of engagement at that time, and uh, there was a, a, a about to be special issue. Is, when is, when's it being released? Uh, soon, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully this year in Journal of Hydrology, which was led by Olivier and, and Catherine. Uh, and then there's a, a book that's coming through by uh, by Spring of Erlag um, on uh, urban water issues. It's got about 26 chapters or so, I think, uh, Vivian. <laughs> That's about the last count. Uh, we, we, we had a target of 35. But that, that focuses on a whole range of urban water issues with France and, and Australia. So that, that those are two, I think, achievements, that are accomplishments that, that have come out of that, that two years, among other activities as well that we've been able to do at an individual or, or uh, level. So I think that's a, a useful start. And I think, I think there's more to be done. And I think part of Part of the next couple of days is, is, to, is to think th through what we can do, but, but that's enough for me. Um, just to, to go on with um, Quentin, uh, there's, um, as an output of a um, pretty workshop, there's also a book on integrating groundwater management with uh, something like 20 or so chapters. Um, Andrew is one of uh, the editors here. Um, and uh, we started the process of um, um, another special issue, uh, but in a French-speaking journal, uh, just to be a challenge for you guys, uh, in the journal which is named Participation, which uh, the focus will be on participatory approaches for land, land and water management. Um, I think one of the... Um, and a very interesting uh, way of collaborating and, and, and going further uh, to address questions together is the um, co tutel uh, PhD thesis. And we, Catherine is one uh, li live example of um, what it can be a success of this uh, kind of process. And Emmeline is here and uh, she's also in this kind of process. And I think it's a very good way to, to facilitate the exchanges because of the because of the distance, it's difficult to have on a regular basis exchanges, uh, but the PhD student is doing the link and I think it's something which we have to, to keep going. And as a, and as a matter of, of questions, uh, common questions which can be tackled together, and also as common experience, um, there's all the issues of, of global change which has already been um, handled before, and there's uh, climate change, uh, as mentioned by, by the ambassador, but also the, uh, demographic change and the, the way towards more uh, urbanization, and also um, um, economic change and the need for food, the incre increase of need for food uh, will impact countries like ours where uh, um, farming is a big, big industry. Um, this raised questions for us as um, how we can transfer place-based experience, why we said before that um, land and water management is really uh, depending, uh, is really contingent to where it's being done. And even if we have a joint, exp um, uh, joint context and, cl and, clim and climate is one of, of, of these contexts, uh, we have to, f to figure out how we can do this transfer. Um, but, but and another, mad, another way of, of, of working together, I think, is um, to end with that. It's, uh, we can still figure out uh, collaboration through projects, and uh, there's the Belmont Forum calls, which may be a way to, to do it, and uh, also working together through the CR, uh, with the CRP, with the, the CG system, mainly, and uh, Alex, uh, I think, will tell us about, uh, about this, this system tomorrow. Um, and also we can have joint sessions and conferences and I want to um, m make uh, um, some uh, advertisement for the residence conference next year in Montpellier um, where we could have a follow-up of our s workshop there. Yeah, uh, one of the things, is that on? Can you hear me? <laughs> 
One of the things that I want to talk about is we currently have Indigenous people, my people along the river, and the traditional owners along the river, we currently have food and water security. We have, you know, a, a hybrid economy that sustains us within a welfare economy. So we currently have that. And uh, I guess one of the things I, I want to say is that um, I spoke very briefly about James Price Point and possibly the, you know, there was going to be the opportunity to build the largest LNG precinct in the world there. And because of the people and the mobilization of the people, that no longer is on the card. But that was looking at gas, a gas reserve within the Browse Basin around 30 million cubic feet, um, you know, feet of gas. What we are now uh, going to be seeing in the Kimberley is the exploration of shale gas. And uh, I, I know, you know one of the things I saw in France was uh, the response to coal seam gas and the moratoriums that are put on coal seam gas in regards to that. Um, and when we look here in Australia and see all of the international evidence, especially what's coming out of America, <laughs> It seems like an oxymoron that we are pursuing these sorts of uh, goals in Australia around coal seam gas and shale gas. So I, I guess one of the things in terms of people would say, well, what, what, what's your story? What do you want to do? And what I want to say is that we have an opportunity in the Kimberley, especially in the Super Canning Basin, which holds about 300 million cubic metres of uh, shale gas. We have an opportunity to look at that and say, how do we measure and value the existing assets? We need an asset management framework to value the existing assets. We need an asset management framework that will value cultural capital, human capital, social, environmental, all of these sorts of things before we destroy it. I think people see this concept of wilderness and think that it's an empty place, that it's void of people and, and all of this biodiversity, but this region is just totally amazing. As I said, we have an opportunity now to prevent the same sort of scenario with the, with the tar sands in Canada. With these assets not only belong to Australians, they belong to the world. And so what I'm putting my hand out for is an opportunity. Um, as I said, you know, I'm just here as an individual. I'm here because I believe that what we have is important for all Australians and indeed the world. <laughs> And what I'm putting before you is an opportunity to look at some sort of collaboration. I have no money, I only have goodwill. So um, I'm coming here w with a hand out reaching and saying, look, we have things in the Kimberley, as I said, do not think that you're going to come to the Kimberley and produce the next food bowl because it ain't gonna happen. But what we do have as indigenous people is that we have a minefield of opportunity for bioprospecting. There is opportunity to look at indigenous agriculture, to look at uh, plants that we have known for millions of years almost in terms of its values. We have one plant that was taken to the U University of Queensland and investigated for 20 years and the researcher came back and he said, oh, we are so excited. This plant has got 30 times the property of morphine. And we said, yes, that's okay, but we haven't told you it's an analgesic, it's an antiseptic, and it has all of these other properties. So indigenous people are there. We want to be entrepreneurial. We want to show you this innovation. We want to show you things that can create new business and new opportunities, but it needs to be ethical business. It needs to be done in the right way so that these, the seed banks aren't controlled by Santos and all of these people, that it belongs to the Australian community. So there's needs to look at how do we protect in, um, you know, intellectual property rights? How does something that is native to this country stays within this country? We have one plant that um, has 50 times the property of vitamin C. It was taken by you know, some of the, uh, uh, one of the French cosmetic companies and is now being propagated in South America. So there's not even the opportunity to continue to have uh, enterprise in that area. So in regards to this, I'm saying that let's measure and value the existing assets before we destroy them in this country. Let's show that we can create a culture conservation economy around good science, around culture, around tourism, around geographical spaces. I mean, the Kimberley is just unbelievably so pristine and so beautiful, and there's so much up there. As I said, it is a greenfield area. It is a clean slate waiting for researchers and academic institutions. And what I say is that there is a duty of care from Australian institutions, from Australian uh, universities, from Australian researchers to come and engage with people, Aboriginal people and other people who live in the region in good faith. Um, one of the things I want to say is that we do need good water governance. It is no longer an Indigenous versus non-Indigenous. It is us as Australians looking at how do we manage and control these assets, not just for now, 
but for future generations. And as we say, as Indigenous people, we have not inherited this land from our ancestors. We are borrowing it from children not born yet. So we have a duty of care as world citizens to look at how do we reach out and do this. And what I'm saying is that there is a great opportunity for Australian and French researchers, practitioners to come to the Kimberley and support um, the work we're doing. I have met uh, a colleague, uh, Philip Villant, who's coming from Nancy too. He's coming with half the money. He's coming next year to come and look at how he can work with us to showcase what we have in the Kimberley. So these opportunities are there. Let's collaborate in good faith and let's protect the assets that we have in this country for not only Australians but for future generations of the world. Thank you. Yes, uh, I wanted to, to say that I completely agree with uh, Olivier on the importance of uh, these uh, PhD students and uh, to have uh, this uh, shared pro program. And perhaps we can also open this, uh, these programs not only for French and Australian uh, students, but also uh, for um, students coming in from the other country where we are working, in Africa or another thing. Uh, I guess we had a very good uh, forum for, for thinking about our cooperation. Is this a new project? Uh, PassNet Plus. PassNet Plus will be for three years uh, from uh, October. And uh, yes, it's uh, centered on uh, Europe Pacific region, but uh, we have other INCO projects uh, like uh, this one in the other region where uh, French is uh, participating. And perhaps we can try to see how we can uh, open and uh, to have uh, some links between uh, this other Inconet project. There is one in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, called CastNet, another one for the Mediterranean parts of, uh, uh, of Africa with um, MedSpring, and others also in uh, South, uh, South America. And uh, I agree that the CRP project uh, can be a good uh, framework partnership at the European uh, project uh, also. And I was very interested by uh, the participation of uh, local uh, knowledge and uh, traditional uh, people. And perhaps we, we can have some exchange about uh, this local uh, knowledge and local, because we have this uh, platform in East Africa working with uh, also people knowing very well their uh, region, like the Maasai, or the people from, uh, from East Africa. And I don't know, I just imagine that uh, to, today at the, the instant, perhaps we can have uh, an exchange or something between people from Kimberley and with the Maasai, with anthropologists and uh, people to see how they can uh, exchange their, uh, their traditional knowledge. Thanks, I'll be quick, because I think we want to get to um, <clears throat> the others in the room. Um, but there's clearly overlap, I think, between Australia and France. There's sort of interest in this area, in the Mekong, Southern Africa and the Pacific, uh, where, where there's an opportunity for dealing with some of the development issues that uh, we can currently see and we know we have to deal with. <laughs> 